Alberta, which has uh, had incredibly lax, virtually non-existent party finance laws, and not coincidentally, we had our first change of government in almost 45 years uh, l last year. And those things are not coincidental. Um, so it is important, but one of the key ways we've tried to enforce equity or tried to bring, uh, accomplish this policy goal of greater equality between political parties and the ability for a variety of actors to compete is through spending limits. And spending limits are focused around the idea that there is a defined uh, election uh, period. So there's, the one change is a change in practice, as I mentioned, and that's the shift to what in a lot of the political science literature has been called the permanent campaign. So one of the best examples of this that we've seen is conservative attack ads when they were in power, right? As soon as uh, Stefan Dion was elected, right, right away, they went after him with ads. It wasn't even election time, but they were advertising against him. Michael Ignatieff, right, the same way. And they tried it with Justin Trudeau. It worked with some success in the first tr two, worked much less successfully in the case of our now uh, prime minister. And, and this is sort of the, the shining example that's held up of uh, the permanent campaign. Now there's a, there's a question as we're trying to sort out the impact that this has had. How much of this was just the, the sort of the Harper government, the conservative way of doing things, and how much of this was really something that was driven by laws or a real structural change? Now, th this idea of a permanent campaign has been observed in other contexts as well. This, this term and this concept has been borrowed from other places, which suggests that, no, we can't just say, oh, this is something that the conservatives invented. That lends some credence to this. I guess the key thing will be to see how the liberals do now that they're in power. But a key point about this is to, to do a permanent campaign, it requires some significant financial resources. Uh, advertising's not free. It requires significant money. So it requires surplus funding for parties, and by that I mean above and beyond what they're going to need or want to spend during the election campaign. But also there's this really interesting feedback loop, right? Because you do these ads, that takes money, but these ads are partly designed also to appeal to your partisans, your supporters, to get them to donate more money, right? So there's a bit of, um, there's a bit of this feedback loop and that this is constantly going on. Um, this, so what's happening now, though, is that a lot of campaigning is occurring outside of the writ period, and a lot of it well outside of it. Some of this campaigning um, is two, three years out from an election. So that's, that's the first change we've seen in party practice, and that's changing the way we regulate, right? When we, we try to increase equality by limiting spending, but we only do it during elections, but more and more of the campaigning is being done outside that period. That's problematic. And the second thing has been the shift to fixed election dates, which have become very, very popular in uh, provincially, and we, we have them federally. And this was really the first federal election that we actually followed a fixed election date. And that actually has rendered that distinction between the campaign period and the uh, outside of the campaign period increasingly irrelevant, right? We know when the election's going to be. So why would you wait till 35 days before the campaign starts? Now, the benefit of the fixed election date is that some of this has always been happening, right? There were, if you look back at the party finance literature back in the 80s, you would see complaints about this, that parties and especially governments would ramp up spending before the election was actually called. And the benefit of this is that it levels the playing field. If the government largely controls the timing of elections, they can use announcement and they even can use uh, government advertising to do some of that pre-election advertising. So in this sense, it does level the playing field a little bit. But it also means that a party with significant resources can outspend the others pre writ So again, it takes away that ability to uh, mitigate the effects of money. Now we saw in this last federal election also the Conservatives employing this, this strategy of actually extending the election period. And they had amended election, the, the Elections Act, the Canada Elections Act, without a lot of people paying attention to it because we're really very concerned about uh, voter registration and voter ID. That, that got most of the attention in the Fair Elections Act, but they'd also brought in this provision that if the election period was longer, it would also increase the spending limit proportionally depending on how much longer the campaign was. And basically, there were a couple of reasons the Conservatives did this. One is that it allowed them to spend more, and if they had a financial advantage, and then they basically did all that advertising towards the end. And I saw this, like many Canadians, I was uh, watching baseball, which I don't ordinarily do. The Blue Jays were making their, their run. So I, I don't usually watch a lot of 
television. I do actually watch a lot of television, but it's always on a PVR. I never watch it live, except for sports. And boy, was I getting sick of election advertising. Um, I like politics. Like, I, I do this for a living. I can't imagine how people who don't like politics were feeling after getting inundated, right? Every half an inning, we'd go through with how evil Justin Trudeau was and how he was going to wreck Canada over and over and over in ads. Um, and this was made possible by this um, playing around with extending the election period. Now, in the saving grace for this, and the thing that should introduce a degree of skepticism for you, is that despite the Conservatives and, and our expectation, again, we don't have any data, the Conservatives outspent the other parties. It didn't work for them, right? I mean, they still lost. So there isn't an easy connection between money and political success. So what I'm saying is re in the regulatory regime, we might need to look at the approaches in some of the provinces. So here in Manitoba, for example, there's limits on advertising that political parties can do in outside of elections. There's a limit per year what they're allowed to spend. Uh, BC actually has a pre-writ period where they also put limits on campaign spending and require different kinds of disclosure. We may need to look at that at the federal level. Again, provinces have been doing some innovative things. The other sort of broader trend that I just want to talk briefly about is the decline in, in public support because one of the things we've also moved to now is a period where the amount of public money we're giving to political parties has diminished. We used to have this thing called the quarterly allowance, which was brought in in 2004, which provided funding to political parties based on the votes they received in the previous election. Now, this, this was, uh, the Conservatives attempted to phase this out in 2008. We might remember some of you. Uh, my students increasingly don't remember this because they, as I remind them, uh, had the bad fortune and bad judgment to have been born much too late to experience all these things. Um, but it spurred this big crisis as the other parties saw a significant part of their financial resources being taken away and uh, tried to oust the Conservatives, essentially. But the Conservatives, when they won a majority, did phase out the quarterly allowance, and that amount of public money being given to political parties has been diminishing. So this part I do actually, I did actually run some data, and I don't have numbers complete for 2015 um, because the last quarter hasn't been reported. It probably will come out next week as the timing goes. But looking at this, it does affect the competitive position of our parties. Um, two parties have been hurt by this, and that's the Bloc and the NDP. The Bloc especially is heavily, heavily reliant on public funding. Basically, the amount of individual contributions has remained relatively constant between the last two elections, but their total revenue has decreased as the amount of public funding has gone down. And the NDP has been in a very similar position. Uh, I do see a little bit of evidence of a 2015 uptick for them um, around the election, but again, I don't have complete data for that. Uh, the NDP is better positioned to withstand this because they were less reliant on public funding than the Bloc was, but still, their, their revenue is decreasing. The Conservatives actually managed to hold about even. Their total revenue stayed pretty much constant. So in other words, what they've managed to do is step up their individual fundraising um, to make up for the money they were losing from the public financing, unless you think, well, that's pretty easy. The Conservatives have this big machine. The Conservatives received about $11 million a year in public funding, which they have managed to make up for by ramping up their individual donations and soliciting individual contributions. Now, it's an open question, being out of power, uh, whether they will be as successful. Uh, there do seem to be advantages for parties in power in raising money. So that's going to be something interesting to watch. And the, the two parties that have actually managed to increase their total revenue have been the Liberals and the Green Party. Uh, so in other words, their increases in individual fundraising have more than outstripped what they've lost from the loss of quarterly allowance. The Liberals, you can attribute that partly to a revival of Liberal fortunes and being more competitive and more successful under Justin Trudeau. But the Green Party's accomplishment is actually pretty significant when you think about it. This is not a party with significant upward momentum, right? It's like they got Elizabeth May in there and they have essentially stalled. They will occasionally pick up a few floor class crossers who will then lose their seats in the next election. And this has essentially been the Green Party's cycle. And the Green Party's rise to power is largely driven by seeking the quarterly allowance. But they've actually managed to increase their fundraising and their total revenue, which I think is actually a really interesting thing. And there's some positive signs about this. It's encouraging parties to connect with voters. So uh, I think we're going to see a more increasingly competitive um, financial uh, situation where, where it is much less one-sided for one party than the other. 
But I'm curious to see whether we're going to see the permanent campaign the way we have in the past. Will we see the conservatives do uh, uh, continue to try to act in this way when they have trouble raising money? And will the liberals use their position um, as being in power to behave similar to what their predecessors did? And finally, I'm curious about to see whether there will be any changes to party finance regulations. Historically, we've kind of done things through a um, agreement between parties. But increasingly, over the last decade, we've seen parties acting more unilaterally. So I'm curious to see whether the Liberals will tinker with the laws uh, the way the Conservatives did and the way the Chrétien Liberals did. Thank you. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think there is a bit of a tendency, and we saw it in 2008 when they wanted to bring, uh, eliminate the quarterly allowance, to be just a little bit too clever by half, right? They, um, so there, there's, if you look at the trajectory of, of voter support, had it been a normal election, the Conservatives actually did really well in September. Had the election been held within 30, uh, 36 days of the call, they would have done quite a bit better. The Liberals took off in the last bit. So yes, I think, I think a lot of their success in fundraising, and I think the calculations went to their head. I also suspect the other thing that factored in, well, the other thing that the writ period brings in is restrictions on so-called third-party spending, right? That outside groups have limitations on what they can spend. And so a lot of groups historically, for example, unions especially, have done big advertising campaigns right before the election. And this essentially, if they had been planning that just took that off the table and neutered a lot of those outside groups. So I think it was partly driven by that, but I think it was partly driven by an attempt to neuter these outside groups. But it was very clear, right, they weren't planning on advertising equally throughout the uh, 57 days or whatever it was. Uh, they were, they back-ended this. This was all in the last three weeks of the campaign, and uh, it backfired pretty gloriously for them. The Liberals were in an interesting position in this federal election, uh, and comparatively, we know when a party has been met with resounding defeat, uh, as they were in 2011, uh, they kind of enter a period of rebuilding. Uh, so they're more willing to take risks uh, and kind of experiment. Uh, the supporter category uh, was uh, kind of innovative, if you will, when it come, uh, came to uh, Liberal supporters. Uh, so I think that that's kind of how they structured their campaign. Uh, whereas the Conservatives were trying to hold on to the support that they had, the Liberals um, had, only, had only to go up. That was, they were in a position of growth. Uh, then when it came to actually uh, their campaign events, I mean, it, it, with social media and Justin Trudeau's selfies, um, every, every campaign rally that they had, uh, I think, was magnified. Uh, on their social media presence. Um, and I think that that ended up playing in their favor, and it still is. Uh, in terms of his uh, online engagement. Given the technologies that are available to parties in campaigning now, the next logical step, it seems to me, is that party leaders will sit in Ottawa for the duration of the campaign and give interviews and give televised speeches. Uh, and there's, there really won't be much need for them to travel around. This idea that leaders have to travel around seems to be a throwback to kind of an old-fashioned era in Canadian politics. Uh, and it, it's sort of recognition of the nature of, of uh, the electoral system. You do have to win in individual ridings. But no matter how many people the party leader shakes hands with during an election campaign or who sees them at a rally, it's not going to be that many. So what's the point? Most people see the leader on TV anyway. So uh, this just kind of seems like a logical extension of, uh, of, of modern c campaign technology to me. Leave voter contact to the people that are adapted to do it, the decentralized campaign organizations in, in each of the ridings. And in fact, I can draw on this research. We, we, we know from other research that parties do get a little bump. They get a little bump in local support if the leader visits the riding. Uh, but what I also found is that uh, campaign organizations are not thrilled when the leader lands in town. It's an enormous logistical difficulty, and it's also an enormous distraction for local campaigns who, for the entirety of the campaign, are running their own show, are doing things on their own for the most part, and then all of a sudden they have to have this big event and, uh, and, and get people out, and there's uh, people from Ottawa giving them orders. So 
from a local perspective, leader visiting is not, uh, is not necessarily a good thing and increasingly I don't think it's going to do much for parties anymore either. Uh, I think it's a bit of both, right? So, I mean, if the parties know that young people aren't voting, uh, so if they have a limited amount of resources uh, and they only have so many people on the local campaigns actually knocking on doors, uh, it makes sense that you're going to knock on doors of people that you know have been your supporters and you know are actually going to turn out. So that it kind of a, of a more strategic um, and in terms of political contact. As for why young people aren't, aren't really translating these political conversations that they're having um, to voting around the political system, uh, this is something that we've been talking about and trying to th and think through at Samara for quite some time. Uh, I think really when you talk to young people, um, it, they care about issues and they are very passionate. Uh, but when it comes to kind of confronting uh, the electoral politics or this like more formal side of things uh, and actually casting a ballot, uh, they don't see it as, as effective um, as, some, as some of their kind of other moves. And I think what's happening, uh, there's a bit of, a, like, of an immediacy effect happening. So young people talk about things on Twitter and online uh, and they kind of can see results. So for, for our generation, um, you know, if we want to get someone, a CEO of a company um, that has done something wrong, if we want to get them removed, uh, all it takes is a Twitter kind of stampede um, and things are going to happen. But we don't see that same kind of effect when it comes to uh, political participation or electoral kind of participation. So I think that young people are used to seeing this kind of instant gratification in terms of how they're communicating in all other aspects of their life. Uh, but when it comes to this more kind of formal thing, uh, it's, not, it's not translating the same way, and I think that's very frustrating to them.